Hello, this is Supreeta. In today's video, I'm going to be covering fungal corneal ulcers. This is usually asked as a 5 mark question or as a long essay. So I'll be covering this under the four major headings of etiology, pathogenesis, clinical features and management. Now when it comes to etiology, in ophthalmology, I think we can always divide it into three major subheadings. That is the predisposing factors, the causative organism and the mode of infection. So when it comes to predisposing factors for a fungal corneal ulcer, it is usually going to be related to the occupation, especially the occupation of an agricultural worker or a farmer because these fungi are usually found in vegetative matter like hay, grain or leaves and twigs and these farmers and agricultural workers are usually prone to trauma by these vegetative matter. So they are predisposed and also Immune suppression is a major predisposing factor for developing a fungal corneal ulcer. When it comes to the causative organism, we know that it is caused by a fungus. But even under fungi, there are three major groups. That is yeast-like fungi, filamentous fungi and dimorphic fungi. What we are majorly concerned about is the yeast-like fungi and the filamentous fungi. Dimorphic fungi usually are not involved in ocular infections. Under yeast-like fungi, candida is an example which causes fungal corneal ulcer in immunosuppressed patients or patients who have prolonged use of corticosteroids. But other than candida, what we are majorly concerned and what we commonly see in fungal corneal ulcers is the filamentous type of fungi, that is aspergillus and fusarium. Aspergillus is very common in northern part of India and fusarium is notorious for causing fungal corneal ulcer in the southern part of India. So these are two organisms which we have to remember. Next, when it comes to the mode of infection, as I've already said, it is usually going to be by trauma, by vegetative matter, and it can also be due to trauma by animal tails. Sometimes animals like dogs or cattle can also have fungi in their tails, so it can also be due to trauma by the animal tail. And the third major mode of infection is going to be antibiotic use and steroid use. Now what happens in antibiotic use and steroid use is going to be that the resident bacterial flora in the eye is going to be destroyed. So when this happens, the fungi start becoming an opportunistic organism and they will start um, you know causing more fungal um, ulcers because the bacterial flora has decreased so there is a loss in balance between the bacterial flora and the fungal flora so this was about the etiology of a fungal corneal ulcer now when it comes to the pathogenesis of a fungal corneal ulcer um, you can divide it into agent factors and host factors. Under agent factors, we know that the fungi are comparatively larger. If you compare it with especially a bacteria, a fungus is usually large. So what happens is the immune system and the polymorphonuclear cells cannot directly go and start uh, destroying this fungi entirely. It takes a lot of time for it to recognize fungi as a foreign body and then start reacting to it. So that is one of the factors, um, agent factors in the pathogenesis of the disorder. And also the fungi release a lot of toxins and enzymes because the body takes a lot of time to recognize the fungus as a foreign body. The fungus has an opportunity to release a lot of toxins and enzymes before it is acted upon by the immune system and when it comes to the host factors now once the you know immune system starts realizing and recognizing that there is a fungus that is invading the cornea and it starts releasing cytokines and enzymes what happens here is it is not a targeted uh, attack or a targeted release so randomly the cytokines and enzymes are released and because of this untargeted release of enzymes and cytokines there is a lot of stromal destruction the normal corneal stroma is also going to get destroyed so this is basically going to be the pathogenesis of a fungal corneal ulcer and the most important thing that we have to remember in a fungal corneal ulcer is that inflammation and vascularization is going to be extremely less compared to a bacterial corneal ulcer. Fungi are comparatively larger, so the inflammatory process is going to take a very long time. And so the inflammation is comparatively uh, slower and lesser when you compare it to a bacterial corneal ulcer and also there is lesser vascularization. So as a result of this, the pain, the redness that we usually see in a bacterial ulcer is not that prominent in a 
mycotic corneal ulcer or a fungal corneal ulcer so because of this signs are always going to be more compared to symptoms in a fungal corneal ulcer so when a patient comes to you he is not going to come with extreme pain or redness it is going to be more of milder symptoms like mild blurring or loss of vision or mild photophobia or mild irritation the symptoms are not really going to be high so we have to be very careful in picking up um, a fungal corneal ulcer because the signs are going to be more than a symptom in a fungal corneal ulcer now when it comes to signs in a fungal corneal ulcer there are some very typical signs that we have to remember uh, if we go from outside to inside let's just start with the eyelids so the eyelids can essentially be uh, you know uh, edematous the conjunctiva can also have a little bit of hyperemia but this is as you can evidently see not as much as what is what is seen in a bacterial corneal ulcer the reaction is you know very mild but the major thing that you can see here is the ulcer now the ulcer in a fungal corneal ulcer has specific characteristics in the sense that it is going to be very dry looking the reason it is very dry looking is because there is no vascularization that is happening so the ulcer is going to look very dry looking and one more characteristic feature is that in a fungal corneal ulcer the ulcer is going to be raised it is going to have a raised margin you can almost see that it looks like it is a second layer that has formed on the cornea it is going to be raised and it is going to have raised margins so that is one classic feature that you will be able to identify in a fungal corneal ulcer that it is going to be relatively raised and it can also have hyperpion whenever we look at the hyperpion in a fungal corneal ulcer you should remember that it is usually going to be non sterile it is usually going to be non sterile because fungi have filaments right especially the filament is fungi what they are going to do is they are going to extend their filaments it goes through the stroma and then it can reach the anterior chamber so it can actually send filaments into the anterior chamber and into the hyperpion so the hyperpion is usually not sterile in comparison to a bacterial hyperpion which is usually sterile because the bacteria does not usually completely penetrate into the anterior chamber and one more classic feature that is usually pathognomonic of a fungal corneal ulcer is going to be feathery edges that you can see here see these are the feathery edges so if you are ever able to see a feathery edge in a corneal ulcer you can be sure that it is a fungal corneal ulcer and one more feature that you might be able to see is an immune ring so this is the immune ring which is also usually classically seen in a fungal corneal ulcer this is the line of reaction between the fungal antigen and the host antibody so that is also seen you might also end up seeing these satellite sort of lesions so these are the various signs that can be present in a fungal corneal ulcer so when it comes to management we're going to look at the investigations and also the treatment under investigations it is very very important to take a thorough history the typical presentation is going to be usually an agricultural worker or a farmer with a history of trauma and it is usually going to be unilateral um it is usually going to be a unilateral problem with mild mild symptoms okay it's going to be very mild symptoms like mild pain photophobia itching irritation there is going to be history of trauma with vegetative matter and it is usually unilateral so you, it is going to present with a typical history so once we are suspecting a fungal corneal ulcer we look at various lab investigations that we can do so the various lab investigations that we can do is definitely take a scraping scraping and we can do various staining we we do a gram stain and we also do a koh mount or koh uh, 10% koh mount can also be done and then if you need a fluorescent staining we can also do calci calci fluor stain okay? and for culturing we are obviously going to do an sda 
to find what kind of fungus is present. So these are the lab investigations that we will be doing. And the other investigation that we can do is something called a confocal microscopy. This is basically a microscope that uses laser. And when we do a confocal microscopy, we will be able to identify a fungus like this. We will definitely be able to identify a fungus like this and sometimes we will also be able to differentiate whether it's a filamentous fungus or it is an yeast like fungus so you can do a confocal microscopy and last but not the least we can do pcr for confirmation and isolation of the organism now when it comes to treatment treatment is pretty straightforward we are going to use uh, an antifungal Although there are new uh, antifungal agents like amphotericin B and many other things, natamycin is still considered the most potent antifungal. It is used one hourly round the clock and then we are going to start tapering its dose for 6 to 8 weeks. The other alternative treatment is also amphotericin B which is also very effective. Natamycin is used for aspergillus and uh, fusarium and nistatin is mainly used for candida. Other than this, if the uh, infection has actually spread into the deeper layers, if it has led to an iridocyclitis or if it has gone to the anterior chamber, we can use an intrastromal or an intracameral um, injection of voriconazole. Intracameral injection is basically directly injecting the drug into the anterior chamber. So we can use voriconazole. And you can also use a systemic antiviral uh, only if the, there is evidence of deep fungal keratitis. Even to the non-specific treatment. So yeah, you can provide atropine, you can also provide uh, hot fermentation or you can also provide dark goggles for uh, photophobia. So these are going to be the non-specific treatment. And then if it is a very severe fungal keratitis where it has uh, breached the stroma, then you can also um, consider a therapeutic um, keratoplasty where there is corneal replacement. So this is going to be the treatment and management of a fungal corneal ulcer. The last thing that I want to cover is the DD for a non-healing ulcer. Now let's take this case that we have given six to eight weeks of an antifungal and even then the ulcer has not healed. So what might be the differentials for these? It might be because the patient is a diabetic. So the uh, you know, the treatment is not able to heal the ulcer completely or it might be because there is a constant focal source of infection like a dacrocystitis that is present. You know, where the fungi or the organisms have, um, ha have been harbored and there is a constant source of infection. So you have to rule out, rule out a dacrocystitis if it is a non-healing ulcer. And last but not the least, you might also want to consider contamination of the medication itself. Contamination of the medication itself because of which the ulcer is not able to heal. So that is all. I hope this was helpful. Thank you.